Order! 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 You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The atmosphere at the conference I just came back from it last night has been pretty upbeat so far. No sign of acrimonious internal splits, at least uh, not in public. Even the arch Blairite, Peter Mandelson, managed to keep a smile on his face as he wandered round the conference centre yesterday, as our Adam discovered when he caught up with the former business secretary in a bit of a media scrum. He began by asking Mandy what he made of John McDonald's speech yesterday. Well, he, well he's become, you know, quite emollient, isn't he? I mean, I don't know what's going on here, but... Has he been taking your advice? No. <laughs> I think it's all spin myself. Um, are you worried you're going to get are you going to, are you going to get chucked out of the party? Are you worried? No. I, I've been in this party for four to five years and I ain't going anywhere. What are you actually doing here? Well, I'm doing fringe events. <laughs> and have you met Jeremy Corbyn while you've been here? No, I have not met Jeremy Corbyn uh, while I've been here. But I've As been in the hall listening to the debate like a good party man. Um, are you going to be watching Mr Corbyn's speech tomorrow? I might, no, I won't. You won't? I will not be there. A prior engagement? What? Have you got a prior engagement? <laughs> are you going to see Jeremy Corbyn while you're here? I hear he wants to come along to my fringe event later about Europe, so uh, you know, if he does, he'll be very welcome. Have you spoken to Tony Blair since Jeremy Corbyn was elected? A few times. What does he think? Um, I, reflective. Reflective sad or reflective happy or reflect? He's reflective, talking a lot about what needs to be done to make the Labour Party in the best possible place to win the next election, as we all are. Thanks. Okay. Thanks Peter Mandelson there at conference. Well, joining us from Brighton is Steve Richards of The Independent and Isabel Hardman, assistant editor at The Spectator magazine. Welcome to both of you. Isabel, what's it like down there? Well, it is surprisingly upbeat at this conference. I think one of the things is that actually the party feels as though at least it's got a, a new leader and it's got front benches in positions. And because those front benches don't have to agree with the new leader, it's quite relaxed. They don't have to work out what the line to take is because there isn't one. And so that's quite pleasant for them at the moment. Right, they're so, so far away from an election. In, well, exactly. They think, of course, five years, whether uh, or not all of those people remain in those positions yet to be seen. But, Steve Richards, is the press sort of disappointed that it's not turning out to be the sort of hard left agenda that they had expected? Probably, although there'll be plenty of ammunition for anyone who wants to portray this as a disaster, as a lot of them are doing. I think something more interesting is going on here in that what leaders have to do is make the best of the situation they're in, whatever that situation is. With Corbyn, he's in a very fragile situation. He's got the Parliamentary Party opposed to him on all the key issues and basically his leadership. So what has he done? He's turned the whole culture of leadership on its head. Since Margaret Thatcher, the test of leadership in British politics has been, I am strong, I will prevail, Blair, I have no reverse gear, Neil Kinnock, if anyone stands in my way, I shoot them. And Corbyn stands up and says, well, actually, they, yeah, the Shadow Foreign Secretary disagrees with me. Oh, that's interesting. We'll have a grown-up debate. Now, he's got no choice but to do that. But it's quite interesting to see how the media copes with that, because it's completely different, although we had a bit of it with the coalition, and how the voters cope with it. My guess is, stylistically, some voters will quite like it and, and that tone. Uh, Isabel Holland, do you agree with that? I mean, this idea that this new politics is turning everything around, uh, as Steve Richards said, we're no longer looking at a sort of traditional style of leadership where the leader says it and everybody has to agree. Is that sustainable? Well, I mean, I think at the moment I do agree with Steve that Jeremy Corbyn seems to be want to be a sort of chairperson of the Labour Party rather than its strong leader. But at some point, even front benchers who are quite happy at the moment to disagree with Jeremy Corbyn are very keen to be able to present some kind of united policy to the country if Jeremy Corbyn is still leader in 2020. And interestingly, more and more of them seem to think that he will be leader in 2020. Whether or not they're happy with that is another matter, but they're slowly starting to think it will be very difficult to get rid of him. Right, well, I mean, John McTurnan, Tony Blair's former advisor, was our guest yesterday, Steve Richards. He claims that the sort of more emollient language and talk of unity is a holding strategy to buy the current leadership time while they take control of key positions on the ruling executive and the policy making. Um, 
um, agenda and then they will impose what they really want to do. Do you agree with that? Well, it's well, n not entirely, no. It's, but it is a reaction to the situation he finds himself in. The reason why Margaret Thatcher portrayed herself in the late 70s as a strong leader who would have no time with discussions with her cabinet and all the rest of it uh, was because Labour leaders like Jim Callaghan at the time were weak and having trouble controlling their party. So it was in her advantage to say that. He has no choice but to say that. Now, whether over time he can either persuade the shadow cabinet or change the shadow cabinet towards his point of view, I doubt he will have other levers. He's obviously got the mandate of his party in this election. So they will have to find a way through. And as Isabel suggests, the key moment is when they take policy decisions. Yes. Um, but I think there is a bit more space than the media. We're so used to this thing that the test of leadership is to prevail on everything. I think there's a bit more space than the media has assumed in trying to sort of just have this debate and discussion. Um, but clearly at some point, for example on Trident, I think he, Corbyn, will lose and the Shadow Cabinet will probably win. Now that will put him in a very difficult and interesting position when they come to decide that. But en route to that moment, I think there will be some appetite for this style. It's not new politics, it's just the only space available to him. And his personality, which is quite sort of emollient actually, I mean he's of the left and he's a rebel who's become leader, but he's quite conciliatory as a person. And so his kind of style yes. helps him en route to right. the nightmarish moment when they have to make decisions. Right, well when we come to those big decisions, one of them of course is the direction of the economy, Isabel Harman, and, and Jeremy Corbyn ran for the leadership on the basis of a radical alternative to austerity and taking that fight to the country. Um, but is he shifting his whole economic philosophy now he's been elected? No, I don't think he is, but I think the, the whole tone of this conference has been well, I suppose an attempt for Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell to say you don't need to be frightened of us, we're not as scary as the press have made us out. So they've been talking in very mild language. John McDonnell's normally very passionate and angry in the Commons, but he's been very gentle in his speech this week. But I think I don't think Jeremy Corbyn's going to water down his economic policy. I think on other policy areas, ones that he's campaigned on for many, many years, he probably is quite happy to take a stand back, which is quite curious given he's become famous for being this principal backbencher on Trident, on intervention, on all those issues. He's actually quite happy to let his party do something completely different, which does beg the question, although you want a leader who takes into, the, into account the views of his party, you also want a leader who brings their principles to the party as well. And it'll be interesting to see how many he has to end up abandoning just because of pragmatism, yeah. something that a lot of his supporters find quite difficult. Well, that's going to be the dilemma, isn't it, in the coming months. Thank you both very much. Go and get your seats warmed, of course, for the speech. I mean, Deborah Mantenson, on that, is he in the end going to disappoint Jeremy Corbyn, the very people who voted for him on a platform of being quite radical? Yeah, I mean, that is the, that is the dilemma, isn't it? That basically, when you ask people what they think, they use vocabulary that they don't very often use to describe a politician. They talk about him being principled, Mm. passionate, decent, honest, you know, I've never heard politicians described that way before. That's what they think. It's actually not about his style of leadership because they haven't seen that yet and they don't know anything about that. It's about the fact that he's not a sort of Oxbridge careerist. Uh, the very fact that he's never sought to be the leader before or to win anything or apparently cared about winning <laughs> gives him that honesty. Um, but actually, I think as things unfold, the, for me, the singing of the national anthem was crucial here. It's, it's sort of like a perfect well, does it go to the, the dilemma that he faces. Oh, I mean, isn't that the case that actually, whether people vote on manifestos or policies these days is probably very arguable, but people do want to like someone. And you're saying on, on some of those issues, he is very likable. I think he, he definitely has an opening here. People are listening to him in a way that they, they don't listen, but they are already starting to feel a little bit worried about some of the things they're hearing. Well, what about then this idea that his speech will be about tone, about feel, about patriotism, authenticity, those things that probably poll quite well with focus groups. Is that what he has to do but today? I think there's already an issue here because you say authenticity. He didn't sing the national anthem. That's one thing people know about him. If he now talks about being a patriot, is that authentic? Is there a danger that he's going to already start to look inauthentic? Right. I don't know. What but I mean, you know, I, I think that he might. I think that's a risk he's taking. We don't have a record of him having done it before. 
Absolutely. In, in fact, rather the opposite. Mm. That what people know is that actually he eschewed all of that. They don't particularly like that. They're a bit worried about it. But if he then kind of turns around, he's already backtracking. He's already spinning. He's already becoming <laughs> something that he wasn't. And that's right. his problem. Thank you. What can we expect in this new Corbyn era? New commitment to unilateral nuclear disarmament today? Probably not. The reintroduction of Clause 4, state ownership, even that's unlikely. Will he sing God Save the Queen? Well, he's going to talk about being a patriot, but that may be a little wide of the mark. Joko, I'm sure, will know. Well, I know a bit. Yes, Jeremy Corbyn is going to wrap himself in the British flag later this afternoon. Striking a patriotic tone, he will declare, I love my country and explain that he's driven by British majority values. It comes after a series of controversies following his election, such as the criticism he received for not singing the national anthem during a Battle of Britain memorial service. Mr Corbyn will also pledge to campaign for a kinder politics and a more caring society, addressing perceived disillusionment with the way politics is conducted at Westminster. However, there wasn't much evidence of a kind of politics yesterday when Unite boss Len McCluskey, who backed Mr Corbyn for the leadership, attacked the government's trades union reforms. He said the plans resembled what the Nazis did to trade unionists in the concentration camps at Dachau. Finally, in an acknowledgement that there are deep divisions amongst Labour members, Mr Corbyn will say that he is not imposing leadership lines. Calling for an open debate within the party, he will say, I firmly believe leadership is listening. Andrew. Thanks, Joko. In a moment, we're going to speak to uh, John Ashworth. He's down at the Labour conference. He's a shadow minister for that portfolio. I spoke to the Labour conference yesterday. We're just uh, getting him mic'd up. Actually, we have got him mic'd up. Super quick mic -ing. John Ashworth, welcome to the programme. Hello, hello. Uh, let's just uh, find out where we're going here because... Mr Corbyn wanted a debate on Trident. We're not having one. Yes. He gave hints he might campaign to leave the EU. Now he's going to campaign to stay in. He campaigned for what was called People's QE, printing money for infrastructure. We've not had any mention of that so far. And he didn't sing the national anthem, but now he will. Uh, what happened to the revolution? <laughs> well, I think Jeremy got elected because he represented a different style of politics. I think party members and the supporters who joined up were a bit fed up with uh, the old style of politics. I think, to be frank, they were a bit fed up with politicians like me, Andrew, politicians who used to be political researchers and special advisors who then become I MPs. I, can, I, I can't can believe that. A, I cannot believe that. Although, although, like you, Andrew, I did come from a working class background and my parents are very proud that I went to university and got a good job and, and all the rest of it. But I think that's what the party members were reacting against. They were a bit fed up of that style of politics but you know Jeremy said we are going to have a debate in the party but more importantly I think with people across the country we're going to look at our structures and, and the way in which we uh, make policy in the Labour Party so we can involve party members and people in the country and I think that is going to be a good thing I'm quite excited about it I'm looking forward to it but those who voted for them and who have their hopes with them they're not going to find this new politics very uh, attractive if they end up not getting anything of what they voted for. For example, uh, I'll move on from the other issues of Trident and so on. In August, Mr Corbyn was backing the idea of nationalising the big six energy companies. Now he's saying, well, the Shadow Energy Secretary, saying they don't want to nationalise them. They're going to have small German-style local energy producers again. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. why would you vote for Mr Corbyn if you don't get anything of what you voted for? Well, Lisa and Andy uh, were talking about the conference today and she described it as being even more radical than uh, nationalisation. Yeah, but, but it's not what he promised. Trident, well, just on the point about... Tri well, what Jeremy promised was restoring democracy to the Labour Party. So, for example, on the point about Trident, the reason why there wasn't a debate at the conference there on Trident is that the CLP delegates on the Monday didn't vote for it. They voted to prioritise housing, mental health, the refugee crisis. So, I mean, that's democracy. We've gone. We're not in the days anymore where the leader of the Labour Party says, "Right, this is it. This is what I want. You're all following it, lads and girls." You know, it's not that anymore. We're having democracy, and the delegates didn't vote for Trident, so that's not why. That's why it wasn't on the conference agenda in the end. But you know, that's democracy. It's a good thing. Right, we should okay. embrace it. it. Not we be, on be scared the, of democracy. It may not be on the conference agenda, but are we in any doubt that Mr. Corbyn still wants uh, to scrap Trident? 
and that he would still like to nationalise the six big energy companies. Well, I think Jeremy Corbyn is fully signed up to the policy announced today by Lisa Nandy about uh, uh, democratising uh, uh, um, you know, en energy and uh, in, in local areas. Democratising energy? That Jeremy, uh, everybody knows I think most that, people would uh, just Jeremy like energy to be cheap. They're not that bothered whether the energy's actually got a vote. They would just like the energy to well, be I cheap. And plenty I, I think they would be interested. I think they would be interested in, in a system which uh, uh, allows, yes, cheap energy, but also allows them to have more say over the energy companies. But like, you know, Lisa Nandy has announced the principle of that today, and I'm sure at some point she'll come yeah, on your program and talk to you in more well, detail. I, I, well, about I hope so. It. Last time she was on, she invited <laughs> me to sit in on the shadow cabinet, so we're still waiting on, on, on Did that. She? Can that's I just bit, point out? That's a bit cheeky of her. I know that. That's why the invitation never arrived again. Uh, <laughs> can I just point? You, can I just point out that these German-style small local energy producers that is now your party's policy produce some of the most expensive energy in the Western world. Well, look, we're going to have a debate about these issues, and that's one of the ones we'll have to thrash well, out. Well, that's a fact in the at. debate. Look, what do you think about it? Well, look, we don't want overly expensive energy. We know from the, the last parliament that people were fed up with escalating costs when it came to energy bills. So obviously that's something we're going to look at. But look, you know, it's 2015. We just lost an election where we got absolutely hammered. So yes, we're going to announce we're going to announce a direction of travel, but we're not going to come out with you know a comprehensive set of policies at this conference. These are things that we want to look at, that we want to debate okay. with people in the party and the country over the over the next few years. What do you say to those people that, that, that say this? There's nothing special about having a debate on all sorts of issues after you've just lost an election and pick a new leader. Everybody does that. All parties uh, do that. But why Mr. Corbyn is concentrating on emphasizing, as you've done, oh, we'll have a debate, we'll have a debate, we'll have a debate, is that he's biding his time until he gets his people into place and can then get his way. Oh, my word. I mean, that's a very... Uh uh, 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 sort of, if I may say so, Andrew, a bit, a bit cynical about Jeremy's approach. He genuinely is interested in a, a real grassroots debate. He would say that all the policies that you outlined at the top of the interview, about which he outlined in his campaign, were consultation uh, came from a consultative process anyway. You know, he had a debate amongst his supporters, and those are the ideas that he came up with. But he genuinely wants to open up the party and have discussion, both with party members, but with people in the country. I mean, look, that's a good thing. It's an exciting thing, you know. And when you've just lost an election where you got absolutely hammered, I think you've got to do that. We, you know, we've got to debate our policies over the next couple of years, absolutely. He also, in, in addition to debate, which, of which there's nothing new about that, as I say, we always have debates, Mr Corbyn says he wants a kinder politics. Yet only yesterday, yeah. Len McCluskey, big trade union leader, one of Mr Corbyn's major backers, he said that what the government with its trade union reforms was quote, yeah. what the Nazis did to trade unionists in Dachau. Is that yeah. a kind of yeah. politics? Well, they're, not, they're not remarks that uh, I would uh, support, but, but I do think that, I mean, I've just done a speech attacking the policies today of the Tory government, so, but I think you, I think you can... Yeah, but you didn't compare the government policies, policy to a concentration camp, did you? No, uh, no I, certainly, I certainly didn't, and they're not the words that I would use, to be frank. But I think you, but you can critique government policies and outline the difference between, or outline where you think government policies. Of course, no one, are going no, no wrong. one's arguing. Uh, uh, yeah. No one's arguing yeah. about uh, critiquing government policies. That's your job. It's also our job too, as yeah. it is our job to critique your policies when we finally get some to critique. The point is that you cannot talk about a kind of politics, and then your main bankroller, your biggest supporter compares government trade union reforms, which may be wrong, they may be useless, they may be bad, yeah. but to compare them to sending people to Dachau? Yeah, no, well, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I mean, okay. I wouldn't have used those words, and, so, I don't, and I don't think anyone in the shadow cabinet would use those, those, that type of language either, to be, to be okay. honest. So would you also agree that when a delegate spoke yesterday, again, in the context of a kind of politics, that if David Cameron replaced the European Human Rights Act with a British Bill of Rights, which would incorporate many of the rights in the European Convention, that, quote, we might as well walk into the gas chamber. Well, no, they, again, they are not words that I would use, and I hope that delegate uh, reflects on the rhetoric that, de that delegate used, because I'm not sure those words are, well, they're definitely not appropriate, but, as I say, 
I don't think you'll find members of the Shadow Cabinet making remarks like that. No, I think the, the memo and kind of politics hasn't quite done the full rounds yet, has it, Mr Ashworth? Well, well, I'm very kind. I'm a kind man, so I've got the memo, and I'm uh, I'm going to engage in kind of politics. You are indeed, and you've always been kind to to us as as, as well. Um, what's the big takeaway you look just finally? What's the big takeaway you're looking for from Mr. Corbyn's speech this afternoon? Other than debate, you've well, told well, us that. <laughs> Jeremy's got to speak to the nation. He's got to give us a direction of travel. But look, I'm, a, as you know, a campaigner. That's what I'm passionate about. I'm looking towards the elections we've got in Scotland, in Wales, in London, and in the council elections across the country next, next year. Uh, and I want him and the party uh, to get focused on those elections, as I'm sure they will, by the way, because that's a big, that's a big priority for us, and I think that's an important, an important staging post for us. So that's what I'm looking for. You know, how over the, over the next few months, how we get campaigning on the ground, and that's what I'm going to be looking for right. from Jeremy's speech today. John Ashworth, uh, live from Brighton, thanks for joining us. Let's see if this kind of type of politics catches on. Mm. How long would you give Jeremy Corbyn to have this debate and for his leadership? Yeah. I think it's really interesting because what I heard in Brighton yesterday was lots of people saying, it's a fixed term, he's got five years, mm. let's not rush into anything. <laughs> and I would be really cautious about taking that advice because... I think the public reach a settled view about leaders pretty quickly. And if you look at the, the, the views on leaders over the years, any leader, you will see that the peak of their popularity tended to happen about three months really? in. Three months. I mean, that's not very long. It's I mean, really I, not very speaking, long. Speaking to other people who've come onto the, onto the programme, yes, well, that's not very sort of optimistic for any leader, I suppose, is it? They haven't got much time. People were sort of saying, you know, we'd give a new leader nine months or so. Uh, they said that about Ed Miliband, and they're mm. saying the same about Jeremy Corbyn. You think that's too long? I think that he needs to be setting out his stall to the public, not to the party, to the public, much sooner than that, they need to get there. There are lots of things they've got question marks over. Right. Lots of things they're worried about. Because one of He's the got to put well, their minds okay, rest. on the public particularly. I mean, let's think about the economy because if they like his authenticity, let's say if mm. he's focus grouped, and of course he hasn't been focus grouped in the way that previous Labour leaders would this have been focus grouped within an inch of their lives. Thirty lives. years that hasn't been focus grouped. Really? I reckon. Right. Thirty so years. It's unspun in that sense. Yep. But. Is it enough authenticity to convince those same voters who maybe like that about him that Labour can be trusted to manage the economy, which was the one thing that certainly polling post-election said was the problem with yeah. the party? I mean, this is the problem. People want authentic leaders. They want them to authentically believe the same <laughs> things they believe. Mm. And actually, their biggest concern is about the economy. And for my money, never mind the debate, he should be saying stuff this afternoon about the economy. Can I just check on this business that it's all determined in the first three months? I mean, Harold Wilson won by the skin of his teeth in 1964. But by 1966, when he went back to the country, he won by a landslide, Labour leader. Uh, and he was more popular in 66, I would suggest, than he had been when he just squeezed in after 13 years of Tory rule in 64. Margaret Thatcher, wasn't that popular mm. in 1979 when she won. Mm. The Tory party was more popular than her, but she was, had a broader popularity by 83. But if you look just at basic approval, you'll see that it doesn't change very much, that that, that three-month window is the moment where people make their minds up. Um, and we could see, I mean, we okay. saw it very clearly. So they make their minds up early. We, yeah, and you could see it very clearly. If you look at Gordon Brown, for instance, you know, he should have gone with, uh, you know, the, not the election. That should have been an election. That was his moment. Yes. With Tony Blair, people turned around very quickly. He stopped being Bambi. He started being a leader they admired. And the initial it's polling past. hasn't been good so far, has it, for Jeremy? No, well, no but he has got, he's there, got three months to go. Um, exactly. Yeah. And, he, you know, he did quite well at the weekend there and... Some of the style yeah. is, is working quite well. You're right about Gordon Brown, though. That was the pivotal point that when was you should his have moment. gone. I've been getting away with it all my life.